Hello and welcome back to Faith Evolving. Today we're going to be talking about progressive Christianity and the accusation that it rewrites scripture. So progressive Christianity is an umbrella term for those who embrace postmodernism in their theological approach. And in this, progressive is not inherently synonymous with the progressive of politics. However, often progressive Christianity focuses on the likes of social justice, environmental stewardship, embracing diversity, and a willingness to question tradition. And a lot of those goals do overlap with progressive ideology and politics, but it's more of a correlation than it is a causation. And many more fundamentalist type Christians often criticize progressive Christianity as unbiblical or even as so far as false gospel. And part of this criticism hinges on the notion that progressive Christianity rewrites scripture, and I reject that, and this is why. It is true that progressive Christianity analyzes scripture beyond its face value. The view of inspiration brings much more humanity to the writing and allows space for mistakes and flaws. And this perspective understands that the events and the people that were recording the events that appear in the Bible were part of a very specific cultural context that they were writing from that was limited. And so all of scripture is open to interpretation, but since fundamentalism builds off of interpreting scripture as solely literal, and that's the only way to draw conclusions from the Bible, if you draw a conclusion that is different from the more fundamentalist, more like conservative approach, the only way that you could have done that is if you had rewritten the words. There isn't much room for looking at it as literature, as poetry, and interpreting it as possibly metaphor. You either reject everything that the text says, or you accept everything with a couple asterisks that the text says as a manual, basically. And to me, this is where the term progressive is actually a bit of a misnomer. Yes, progressive Christianity is progressive in maybe its ideology or its goals. It's about making advancement. However, it's regressive in its interpretation of scripture. It intentionally pays special mind to history and literary styles and translations. It looks at what were the motivations or the context that translators or the people writing it down or recording it for the first time were in. Why, why were they writing this? Why did they think it was important? Why was it important that these particular stories were put in the canon? The aim is to have a more precise and a more holistic view of the Bible. A notable example of how, considering what was happening in history at the time, informs our interpretation of scripture is Roman household codes in the epistles. The early Christians were genuinely persecuted for their faith. Not what people are claiming in the U.S. right now. That's putting chemicals in the not water that turn the friggin' frogs gay. But because of their radical message of subversive justice and toppling oppression, they were targeted and often killed. And so they're like, we'd like to not be killed if possible. Do you have any advice? And Paul and other people wrote them letters. And the goal was to try to help them blend in so that they can have community without getting martyred all the time. And in that, there was a fair bit of compromising of, you know, it's best if you fall in line with these Roman household codes so you have less of a target on your back. But within that, try to live out this message as best as you can. And also, it's crucial to consider that Paul himself was a new Christian, and so he was kind of figuring it all out as he was writing these letters. So his theology and his ideas evolve, and it's why there's so many inconsistencies, because he was a person just trying to figure it all out, and himself trying to not get killed or imprisoned that much, though it still happened, but prolonging the inevitability as much as he can. It's almost as if his faith was evolving. I, it's amazing. And a notable example of how literary style should be considered is as it pertains to apocalyptic literature. Now, when I say apocalyptic literature, I'm not talking about the craze of trilogies that they then turned into four movies 
Hunger Games, Divergent. I was in middle school. I was on the front lines of that. No, I'm talking about like Daniel's dreams and revelation. So in Greek, apocalypse means revelation or disclosure or an unveiling. It's about being able to see things that wouldn't have previously been known. And it's not just the end of the world, point blank, we're all dead now. It's the end of the world as we know it. So uh, maybe chill on the rapture stuff. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So in the Bible, people have individual apocalypses where you have an encounter with the divine and you personally see a situation clearly for what it is. But then there's also like this large scale crazy stuff with natural disasters and stuff. And you're like, what's going on there? And that's what we're talking about with what I said before with Daniel's dreams and the entire book of Revelation specifically. It is poetry and is full of symbolism. And it's about death and rebirth like a phoenix. Like a and all of the symbols can be traced throughout, you know, the rest of the biblical literature to that point. That's why it's at the end. But then people decide to interpret it literally and scare people. And it makes me very angry and um, probably will be another video at a different point when I'm able to take a whole class in it. And I feel confident more in my words. But yeah, don't take poetry Literally, it'd be like reading a John Milton poem, be like, that's what heaven is like, or reading Dante's Inferno and being like, that is for sure factually what hell that's definitely real is like. Except wait, we literally already did that. Help. Why don't we understand metaphor? Why don't we understand literary devices and figurative language? I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. If I'm being elitist, leave it in the comments. I could be. I could be being too snooty. I did listen to NPR as a child. Next up, original languages and mistranslation. So, this is a word that appears in the Bible. Referring to pedophilia. That someone mistranslated to mean homosexual. And according to the 1946 project, which is a really cool film, Y'all should watch it. A 21 year old seminary student was like, hey, I think you might have mistranslated that and it's gonna be weaponized against people. You should check it out. And they're like, oh, you were right, but the damage was done. And now we have conversion therapy. So looking at original languages is pretty important, right? And then we got our doctrine makers. Sweet, sweet St. Augustine and his Augustine confessions. Is it August, is it? Augustine or Augustine? Take your pick, darling, either one. Did Florida just be like, we're gonna say it's St. Augustine? I'm nervous that I sound like an idiot. Um, no comment. So yeah, he wrote his confessions and it's a mix between exegesis of just being like, this is how we should interpret the Bible and just his life, kind of like a little autobiography memoir situation. And so he projected a lot of his own stuff in there and we were like, his life experience is universal and it should apply to all of us. All because they didn't have therapy back then. So all of that is really fun. But do you know what's the most fun about all of this? Fundamentalists have actually rewritten scripture in a way. I mean, they just made their interpretation the only interpretation. But in their eyes, that would require rewriting scripture. I'm being too sassy. As I said, homosexuality was added and demonized in 1946. That was not that long ago. And we're like, it's always been like that. I don't know what to tell you. I wasn't talking about pedophilia. It's always been like that. Also, Genesis 316, not John 316, calm down. There are other 316s in the Bible. They changed your desire shall be for your husband to against your husband. And that has been weaponized against women to be like, it, you always, should disagree with your husband and feel sorry about it. And it's Eve's fault. Women are terrible. Cover up your shoulders. What? You know, emphasizing fairly young doctrine, again, just as fact, it's fact now, including substantiary atonement theory, which was first recorded in the 16th century, that a debt had to be paid for your sins, so Jesus had to die. And from that, we gathered, you are terrible. 
Someone had to die because you are so gross and yucky. Doesn't that make you feel terrible? And it perpetuates hate disguised as love, that whole I'm coming to you in love to tell you that you're a whore, a bull person. <laughs> when the whole thing's just love and justice and toppling oppression. Also, again, with the end times rapture, that was from the 1830s because of what's his name? John Nelson Darby. Thanks, buddy. So here's my conclusion, my jolly old conclusion. For those who are accusing others of rewriting scripture or cherry picking or false gospel, to first take out the plank in one's own eye so you can see clearly to remove the speck in your neighbors. Cause I'm sure my theology, I got some stuff wrong. You gotta pull out the other thing to make sure you clearly identify it. And I try to do the same. I really do. Um, so I got pretty sassy. I just want to get back to watching Riverdale. I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I won't get take any hate for it. It is wildly entertaining for how terrible it is. Just like fundamental. No, I can't say that. Bye.